All right, welcome everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, I'm Sylvie Chiborowski with Kearns and West, helping to facilitate today's meeting. And you are here at a meeting open to the public to go over the Western Oregon State Forests Forest Management Plan and Habitat Conservation Plan efforts. So we appreciate your participation today. Um, and I'll just, I have a few slides here to just go over our agenda and some of our meeting protocols and then we'll get into the meat of the meeting. So if you go to the next slide. All right, I'll just go over the agenda for today. Um, so after we get through our welcome and introductions, we're gonna dive right into an update on the forest management plan and associated implementation plans. So we'll hear from ODF on that effort and have some time for some Q&A and discussion there. And then um, ODF will also present some draft goals that are being developed as part of the forest management plan process. Um, so they'll provide a little bit more information about how those are being developed, why they're being developed, how they're gonna be used, and kind Kind of go through them at a high level and provide some time for um, Q&A on the draft goals. Um, and then we're going to have an update on the habitat conservation plan. So we'll turn over to um, ODF and to Troy Raymig at ICF to provide an update on the habitat conservation plan. And Terry O'Rourke is also here with NOAA Fisheries to provide an update on the NEPA process that's um, ongoing with the habitat conservation plan. Then we'll get into a um, some time for just summary, next steps, and other ways that you all can continue to be engaged in the FMP and HCP efforts. And for our final part of today's meeting, the kind of you know formal presentation updates, Q and A portions are scheduled today from about two to four p.m. And then we just have an informal hour from four to five p.m. to talk about anything of interest to folks here. If anything came up during um, the presentations or the Q and A that you just want to delve into a little bit more deeply, we just have an hour set aside there to cover any of those topics or to end early um, if there isn't much interest in talking about those topics. So that's the agenda for today. And then on the next slide, um, I'll get into just our reminders for remote participation tips. So we encourage folks to just keep yourself on mute when you're not speaking to reduce background noise. Um, and when we get into our Q&A portions, we'll just ask you to raise your hand to get into the queue to ask your questions. Um, and I'll show you how to do that on the next slide. And you can also press star nine on your phone if you're joined by phone only. And we'll remind you of the Q&A portions about that. Um, we encourage you to use video when you're speaking and asking your questions to promote that face-to-face -face kind of conversation, pretend we're in a real room together, and also ask you to say your name and affiliation before you're speaking so we get to know one another. Um, and if you haven't done so already, we also encourage you to update your name in the participant list since we don't have a real sign-in sheet just to know who's here. And so we call on you by your correct name when we get to Q&A. Um, if you hover over your screen, you'll see a participants icon at the bottom. If you just click on that, it'll open up a participants tab and you just hover over your name and um, provide first, last name, affiliation, pronouns, however you'd like to identify yourself. Um, and then we are hoping to have a lot of Q&A and discussion today, and we do have the chat feature open for troubleshooting. So if you have any issues, we ask that you send a message to Aaron Bothwell, who will be helping with some of the behind the scenes webinar management today. Um, and throughout the meeting, we encourage all of your verbal comments and questions, and you're also welcome to email comments to Jason Cox, the, whose email is up on the screen here, and Aaron's going to put that in the chat so you have it as well. Okay, um, and then on the next slide, just some quick features of the Zoom platform here. Hopefully you're all Zoom experts by now, but these are just some reminders of where to find the mute and unmute buttons, how to change um, your participant name and where to find the raise hand icon. That's right there where the reactions button is. Um, on the next slide, just a reminder of some of our discussion guidelines. So we have, um, a good agenda today and hope to stay on topic as much as possible. And when we get to our uh, Q&A 
sessions, we hope to provide a balance of speaking time. So making sure we're hearing from questions from a diverse um, set of people. And um, we also ask that you just listen to understand, ask questions to clarify, and really just dig into the content while respecting each other's viewpoints and interests, and really just focusing comments on the topic at hand as much as possible. Okay, and then I think on the next slide, we have some project information. So here are just the contacts for the different efforts. So if you want more information about the habitat conservation planning effort, you can email Cindy Kolomachik and there's a project website for that one. And there, if you'd like to get more information about the forest management plan, you can contact Sarah Lathrop. And there's also a website, separate website for the FMP. And Aaron will also put those website um, links into the chat so you have them in front of you. And also just a reminder that this meeting is being recorded and the recording will be posted to the ODF YouTube channel after today's meeting. All right, I think that's all the intro stuff here. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Liz Dent, State Forest Division Chief, to provide a bit of a welcome and opening, and then we'll dive in. And it looks like you're on mute, Liz. There we go. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. As um, Sylvia said, my name is Liz Dent. I serve as the State Forest Divi Division Chief for the Oregon Department of Forestry. Really happy to have everyone here today and have some time to um, share with you where we are with our planning processes. And there certainly is a lot going on. And uh, we really empathize with those of you that are trying to kind of wrap your heads around what's you know, what is part of what and working on these multiple pieces. So I do want to just take a minute to give you a holistic picture um, and help help us kick today off as well. Um, and so really the forest management plan, and we're, we're largely focused on the forest management plan goals today, but it's the forest management plan that is the umbrella or the overarching uh, policy that drives how we manage state forests. And many of you have been following our HCP process, which we've been working on diligently for about the past three plus years. And um, what the forest management plan does is it gives us the vehicle to implement that HCP. So much of what we've been working with y'all and sharing with y'all around conservation measures for threatened and endangered species roll into, if you will, um, the forest management plan. So really the forest management plan is that document which brings it all together and provides um, the division with clear direction on how to manage these lands um, over the decades to come. There are a lot of components to a forest management plan beyond protecting threatened and endangered species. So you'll see there are several goals that speak to that as well. So for example, drinking water quality, uh, climate change, uh, recreation, air quality, cultural resource areas, et cetera. So those are all pieces that of course we're always uh, needing to um, manage our forest to meet the goals associated with those. So again, an overarching policy document um, ultimately adopted by the Board of Forestry. So you'll get some updates today for sure, um, but just highlight that the first administrative draft of the Habitat Conservation Plan is on the ODF website. Um, and we're currently going through the NEPA process. Um, and at the same time, we're developing these goals and strategies for the forest management plan. So those things are working forward together. Um, we uh, want to be able to share when and where you'll have uh, the ability to provide input on all of these um, sort of moving parts, HCP, um, the Forest Management Plan, and NEPA. Um, <clears throat> any changes to the Habitat Conservation Plan will be facilitated, facilitated excuse me, uh, through the federal process, and that's the best place to comment um, specifically through the the uh, process where the draft EIS um, is revealed to the public. And that again is a federal process. It's not being uh, led or hosted by the Department of Forestry. So that would be an important um, touch point for folks. 
There will be additional opportunities for public engagement, uh, but again, that's um, all gonna be handled by the federal services, specifically NOAA Fisheries as they work the document, the HCP through the NEPA and the EIS process. So again, today the FMP update is gonna be the focus um, and specifically introducing y'all to the draft goals. So with that, I'll turn it back to, not sure who, Sylvia. Back to me. Thank you, Liz, appreciate that. Yeah. All right, so we'll get into the forest management plan update in just a second. And before we do that, we do just wanna do some intros and see who's in the room today. So we have about 75 participants and won't be able to do around the room intros um, cause that would take a lot of time, but we do wanna get a sense of who's here. So we have an, a, a poll, if you don't mind launching that Aaron, just to get a sense of kind of who's in the room today. So if you don't mind just describing um, how you describe yourself, whether with a conservation group, a county um, official, federal state agency, interested member of the public, if you're on one of our HCP steering committee or scoping team, industry representative, recreational interest, tribes or other, just let us know um, who you are so that we have a sense of who's here. And as you all are filling out that poll, I'll just do some quick project team introductions here. So again, I'm Sylvia Chugorowski with Kearns West helping to facilitate this meeting and um, on my team as well, I have Ellen Palmquist who's helping to take some meeting notes and provide logistics. And then Aaron Bothwell is helping with some of the webinar management. And I'll turn it over to ODF for some intros. So over to Mike, then Cindy, Sarah, and Nick. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Wilson. I'm the Acting Deputy Division Chief of Policy for the State Forest Division. Hi, everyone. This is Cindy Kolomaychuk, the Habitat Conservation Plan Project Manager, and nice to see you all on a sunny afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Lathrop, and I'm serving as the FMP and IP Project Manager. Happy to be here today. Oh, that's me. Uh, hi, I'm Nick Palazzato. I'm the State Forest Wildlife Biologist. Great. And there's a lot of other ODF folks obviously working on this, but that's kind of the core team there. And Troy, quick intro from you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Troy Raymond with ICF. Um, I'm the project manager on the, the technical, technical consultant team for the HCP for ODF. Great. Thank you, Troy. Okay. And thanks, everyone, for participating in that poll. So we have a good kind of cross section of folks with us today and appreciate you all being here. All right, so with that, um, I will hand it back over to Mike to provide an update on the forest management plan along with Sarah Lathrop. Can you validate that you see the slides, Sylvia? I do see the slides. Perfect, thank you. All right. Well, thanks again, everyone. And so we'll be giving an introduction to our forest management plan uh, and implementation plan project. I'm going to start off with a fairly high level and then dive into the goals, uh, as was mentioned earlier. So in February 2021, the State Forest Division initiated the Western Oregon State Forest Management Plan uh, and Implementation Plan Development Project. And as Liz was describing, the FMP really establishes the overarching policy goals and strategies for managing state forests and the uh, IPs, implementation plans, characterize <clears throat> how the FMP will be implemented across the landscape. Um, the purpose of the project is to develop an FMP and implement IPs for Western Oregon state forests that implement the draft habitat conservation plan strategies as well as strategies for forest resources that are not included in the HCP. Uh, for instance, cultural resources, recreation, air quality, and, and so forth. I will provide an overview of our planning structure and how the companion forest management plan and implementation plans fit with the HCP. And Sarah will then provide more details on the project timeline, structure, and engagement plan. After these topics, we'll pause for some questions and answers and transition uh, to introducing the draft FMP goals after that. We will close the FMP update with details on how to provide written comment on the draft goals, 
upcoming key dates and next steps for the project team. Okay. So ODF, <clears throat> ODF manages Oregon State Forest to achieve greatest permanent value for Oregonians, which involves providing balance among social, economic, and conservation values. To achieve this, ODF uses a tiered planning effort to guide and implement forest management plan actions. Forest management plans, or FMPs, provide for high-level management goals and strategies. The Board of Forestry adopts an FMP as an Oregon administrative rule after making the finding that the FMP achieves that balance. Habitat conservation plans, or HCPs, are a mechanism by which non-federal landowners like ODF can comply with the Federal Endangered Species Act. While forest management plans are not required to be coupled with the HCPs, HCPs provide for assurances that allow for more certain and cost-effective implementation of FMPs. An HCP serves to provide the bulk of conservation strategies for the FMP, so they complement each other. Implementation plans are mid-range plans that describe the current condition of the forest and serve to set discrete objectives for specific geographic areas and timeframes to provide for orderly progress towards FMP goals. Under the current FMP, IPs have been developed at the district level with a 10-year time horizon. Annual operations plans detail the specific management actions for the upcoming fiscal year and describe how those actions fulfill the IP objectives. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so the various plans have different uh, contents uh, in that tiered structure. So for instance, forest management plans, uh, as I mentioned, they're adopted as administrative rule. And basically the board finds that they provide for GPV. It's a very long range plan with no set time horizon. Although they are reviewed every 10 years, the board is under no obligation to necessarily change them uh, at that point. And so they are designed to persist for a long period of time with small revisions rather than uh, having to pursue new ones. They contain guiding principles for how the plan will be developed, goals for specific forest resources, strategies to implement those goals, guidelines for implementation, asset management, adaptive management, and they also describe the implementation levels. Implementation plans are approved by the state forester and they are more tactical plans. So they achieve the goals of the FMP. They are currently district specific and that is an administrative boundary within state forests that may change under this plan or it may stay, stay the same. But they're mid-range plans currently, like I said, every 10 years. District, they contain the district overview of key resources and land ownership, management opportunities, an annual harvest objective, current forest structure on the landscape, which under our current plan is a surrogate for different habitat types, and the desired future forest condition. Annual operations plans are approved by district foresters. <clears throat> And they're an operational plan that are designed to, in turn, achieve the IP objectives. They're district specific and they are uh, by fiscal year. They contain description of harvest operations and forest projects, specific timber sales, habitat improvement projects, young stand management activities, recreation infrastructure development opportunities, road management projects, and various monitoring and research. So these plans basically fulfill each other uh, in that order. Okay, next slide. So again, the FMP is the umbrella document that codifies ODF's goals and strategies for managing state forests. A number of other factors, ranging from statutes and rules to the strategic goals of other agencies, factor into the FMP. There are varying degrees to which these affect the FMP. For instance, the draft HCP will set a standard for the FMP in terms of conservation commitments for the HCP covered species. 
The Oregon conservation strategy will inform FMP strategies to address all native fish and wildlife more broadly. And that's ODFW's uh, governing document for uh, strategic conservation. ODF's climate change and carbon plan will provide the context for climate smart forestry and recreation, education, and interpretation strategic planning will guide the development of goals and strategies for providing meaningful opportunities for Oregonians to interact with the forest. In addition to the FMP goals and strategies, guidelines for asset management, implementation, and adaptive management will provide direction to the next planning level, implementation plans, as well as the adaptive management plan and specific monitoring plans. Beyond that in this chart, you can see the annual operations plans that I mentioned uh, as well. There's a few other things on here, including the funding level, operational policies, and of course, adaptive management feedback loops. So there's quite a number of things to consider here, um, but the main thing that we're trying to get across today are, is how the FMP incorporates the outside uh, documents into the goals and strategies and then transitions uh, uh, those transcend into the implementation plans uh, and operations plans. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah, who will go over some of the project management and timelines. Thank you, Mike. So as mentioned earlier, my name is Sarah Lathrop, and I'm serving as the FMP and IP project lead. The graphic on this slide is the working forest management plan development timeline. Please note the elements represented in the timeline are subject to change. The division is still heavily engaged in supporting the 2021 fire season, and depending on the impacts of the support, adjustments to the timeline may be required. So starting off at the top left with FMP content, this purple bar represents the timeline for developing the draft FMP. The project team will be developing FMP content for the next six months, and the goal will be to provide a draft FMP for the April 2022 Board of Forestry meeting. The division will be asking for direction on the draft and will then enter a period of draft refinement and technical writing. The second draft of the FMP will be due in July 2022 in preparation for the September Board of Forestry decision to enter the formal rulemaking process. The remainder of the content development timeline is to finalize the FMP, which ends December 2022, when the project team submits the final draft FMP for Board of Forestry decision. So moving on to the second bar labeled FMP modeling represented in blue, you will see the model preparation is already underway. When the data updates are complete and the project team has produced the first draft FMP strategies, model calibration will begin. Model calibration will be conducted between October and December 2021, and model scenarios will be run between December 2021 and February 2022 to support the development of the modeling outcomes analysis report. The third bar, labeled FMP rulemaking, represented in green, shows some of the high-level processes if the Board of Forestry makes a decision to enter the form formal rulemaking process. The team anticipates a 30-day public comment period in October and will use the following month to incorporate input received prior to submitting the draft FMP for board decision. Moving along to the next row, which is represented in yellow, is our planned public engagements. This month, the focus for engagement is on introducing and discussing the draft FMP goals. In addition to today's meeting, the project team will be conducting a joint stakeholder meeting on August 18th where the draft goals will be discussed in more detail. The second yellow box on this row shows the tentative meetings being scheduled for October 2021, in which the project team will introduce and seek feedback on the draft FMP strategies. We are working to schedule a meeting open to the public the week of October 11th and a joint stakeholder meeting on the week of October 18th. The fifth row represented in orange are planned engagements with the Forest Trust Land Advisory Committee, also referred to as the FTLAC. There is an FTLAC meeting in late August at which we will discuss the draft FMP goals. And in October, we plan to introduce and discuss the draft FMP strategies. 
The final element represented in this timeline is the Board of Forestry plan, which highlights the deliverables the division expects to bring to the board over the next two years. Starting at the far left is the completed June 2021 meeting where the team provided a high level informational update on the draft FMP, um, excuse me, on the FMP IP project. Moving to the right in August 2021, the division will be conducting Board of Forestry member check-ins for the purpose of onboarding and information sharing in preparation for the November 2021 board meeting. In November, the division plans to bring the guiding principles with recommended changes that reflect the current environment, the draft FMP goals, and will be seeking direction on the desired elements for the modeling outcomes analysis report. In April 2022, the division plans to provide a draft FMP and to present the draft FMP strategies and the modeling outcomes analysis report. Please note the timing of this meeting is dependent on when the draft environmental impact statement for the draft habitat conservation plan is presented. More information on the NEPA process and timeline will be provided later in today's agenda. The goal for the April 22 meeting 2022 meeting is to receive direction from the board on finalization of the FMP in preparation for the September rulemaking decision. In June of 2022, more informational check-ins with board members will occur to prepare for the September meeting. In September, the team will provide a second draft FMP, which will be considered near final, pending the decision to enter rulemaking and finalization after the public comment period in October. In addition, the division will present the implementation plan framework and modeling at that time. The final Board of Forestry meeting depicted on the project timeline is in February of 2023, in which the division will be seeking a board decision on approval of the draft Western Oregon Forest Management Plan and the draft Habitat Conservation Plan. So now that we've discussed the FNP development timeline and milestones, I would like to narrow our focus on the engagement process. The project team has built a robust workflow to seek early input on draft content to ensure there is ample time to discuss and incorporate feedback received. The workflow developed is as follows. The project team will review content from the previous FMP revision effort determine the required changes and revise it to produce a current draft. The draft content will undergo internal review and review by our state partner agencies, including the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Environmental Quality, and the Department of State Lands. When the internal review is complete and revisions made, the project team will distribute the draft content to the Board of Forestry, FTLAC, and the State Forest Advisory Committee for review and input. The content will then be distributed to the public for review and written feedback and a deadline or will be providing a deadline to ensure that the project team can keep the delivery schedule on track. The team will introduce the content in existing meeting venues and scheduled meetings open to the public and stakeholders to discuss the content in more detail. When the deadline for written feedback is reached, the team will review, discuss, and incorporate the input into the revised draft content. In addition to the FMP components being shared during the initial drafting period, if the board decision is to enter formal rulemaking in September of 2022, there will be an opportunity to review and provide written comment on the full draft FMP. With the amount of information that we just went over in the timeline and these processes, uh, I would like to take a pause and uh, answer any questions folks may have. Great, yeah, thank you, Sarah and Mike for all that great information. Um, so if anyone has any questions, just please go ahead and raise your hand on the platform and um, we can get some questions answered. Okay, so I see a hand up from um, Trigvi, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, Steen. Actually, thank you for an accurate presentation. Uh, no worry. What I'm particularly curious about is given the proximity to the present of your modeling process, is your modeling fully including the impacts of forest operations on water outputs for drinking water and salmon? Uh, 
Drinking water is kind of the poor strep stepchild of forest operations, but is exceptionally important to the general public. And so I would hope that your modeling output, given that there is current research on forest age relative model output from watersheds, uh, that that modeling output would really go into solid depth on water outputs from forested landscapes. Can you say anything about that at this point? Yes, uh, we can. Uh, so it will. And the way that it will get at that is um, it, it will describe from the modeling outputs the relative amount of different age classes in watersheds, uh, along with the proportion of that watershed that ODF uh, state forests really controls. Um, a very similar, it's well, it's actually pretty much the same analysis uh, as uh, was done for the uh, draft HCP. Um, and so I assume we'll probably see that again in the EIS as well, but Troy can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe there's an appendix to the administrative draft HCP that actually goes into detail on that. And in an attempt to capture those forests that are in the so-called thirsty stage uh, when a young forest is rapidly growing uh, and can result in, in uh, and can affect the uh, available flow of water. So yes, that will also be done as part of the FMP uh, modeling outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on the FMP process or pieces? I see a hand up from Laura. Hi, um, back on the timeline. So um, I took a quick screenshot of it. So is the public engagement that's scheduled for October of this year, the last public engagement meeting that's gonna be scheduled between basically this year and when it's adopted in 2023, or will there be more check-in meetings um, past this fall? Good question. So um, the ones that are represented on the timeline are just those that are confirmed or being scheduled currently. Um, we'll continue to uh, put opportunities on the map as soon as we have the right content at the right time. We'll, we'll include the public and our stakeholders in those processes. Okay, and then a uh, similar question. So you mentioned that there'll be a public comment on the final FMP as it goes into a rulemaking. Um, will there be public comment when the draft, first draft comes out or along the way or how will that work? We haven't planned for a specific public comment on the drafts. Um, that's certainly something that we can talk about as a team and consider. Um, but the, the real focus in these early stages is sharing the content as it's being drafted so that we can in incorporate that early feedback. That's our primary mission during these next six months is just to get people's input so that we can actually um, review it and, and incorporate it for that first draft. All right, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And Amanda, and just a reminder to say your name and affiliation as we get to know each other. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Sylvia. Amanda Astor, Forest Policy Manager for Associated Oregon Loggers. Um, just looking at the model preparation, that looks like where we are right now. Um, I'm just wondering, as far as the integration with the HCP, recognizing that that is currently being uh, um, analyze the EIS is, is underway with the federal services. Um, are you, what, what types of assumptions, I guess, are you making related to the HCP and the HCAs and all the other uh, areas? Because I'm sure that all of that and the acreages and everything is going into that modeling process. So can you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Yeah, and it's a good time to point out, you know, the differences that folks can see to expect, uh, expect to see from the EIS process versus the FMP process. And so the, uh, the FMP model preparation is being done with the administrative draft uh, that's currently available for the HCP. And so that is that HCP policy overlay that will be used to assess the FMP outcomes. What we're doing the FMP modeling for is really to further refine uh, the outputs um, on a, for a number of different resources uh, as we move forward with the FMP. 
As you know, uh, for those who followed the HCP process, it sets a, you know, pretty uh, clear standards for management uh, for those, for riparian conservation areas, for habitat conservation areas, for those sorts of, of things uh, that are directly associated with the conservation actions. What we, what the HCP refers to as the matrix lands, which are basically everything that's not in an HCA or an RCA, is something that we really need to uh, uh, determine the management strategies for. And that's the driver for this modeling and, and to understand those outcomes. There are a few things that we will refine relative to the HCP management. And one of those is the particular silvicultural pathways within habitat conservation areas for, those, for that management that's occurring there. So what you're going to see happen, and, and we don't want people to get confused with this, is the EIS will come out and it will uh, have a relative set of outcomes uh, between our proposed action, which is our administrative draft HCP, and uh, a, a range of alternatives that's being developed. And so that'll, that will describe that situation, but it is essentially using the same uh, model data that we used, that we presented before, um, that pretty much was the backbone of the comparative analysis uh, document that came out in October uh, 2020. So that's how the FMP and the EIS modeling are, are going to differ. And we just, we, as we move forward with these processes, we'll be constantly sort of speaking to that because we don't want folks to get confused between um, different sets of outcomes that they'll see from really what are two different processes. I just have one quick follow-up if that's okay. Uh, just for clarity of the, um, just for everybody, I don't know, any, somebody else might be thinking this. So um, so basically at the end of the HCP process, right, the, the EIS comes out, there's a range of uh, alternatives. I'm, I'm guessing all of which would qualify uh, a incidental take permit. So would that then allow you guys to work within any of the, that range of alternatives within the, uh, the forest management plan, or is there gonna be a, um, a specific de decision point of what the alternative is? I guess I'm, I'm just a little bit curious, you know, for instance, if there's a decision made by the decision maker for the NEPA, um, and that is different than what you guys utilize to do your initial modeling, uh, how does that work? You know, what does that process look like? Do you have to completely do all work over? Because there's going to be certain things that influence other decision points down the road within this process. Uh, just trying to better understand kind of that, that integration. Yeah, thanks for that. I think really um, in terms of the uh, what's available to do once that range of alternatives comes out, I'd like to hand that over to Terry O'Rourke if I could. Um, and let her kind of describe what the range of uh, potential actions by the applicant, that would be us, right, uh, uh, are within that process. Are you turning that over to me now or in the NEPA discussion? Yeah, that's a good question. Would you, would you rather wait until the NEPA discussion to address that question? Uh, yeah, probably. So others who don't have the NEPA background can know what we're talking about. Yeah, that would be helpful. And Amanda, not dodging the question, but we do have an HCP update and NEPA update all rolled up for the latter part of this meeting. All right, great. And if your question doesn't get answered there, Amanda, please ask it again. Okay. Um, Commissioner Baines. I will hold my question until after your NEPA and HCP update because you may end up answering it for me um, during that update. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, Greg, Jacob? Yes, in regard to all the discussion about uh, climate change and uh, uh, carbon sequestration, my, I have a general question. Is the concern uh, along those lines um, being addressed in both the um, uh, 
the AOP as well as the HCP. With regard to climate change uh, specifically, that is an FMP um, issue for us. The HCP uh, does, of course, the EIS, of course, will uh, deal with certain uh, aspects of climate change in its, in its analysis. But really, uh, in terms of setting goals and strategies uh, to develop resiliency and also look for opportunities to store carbon on state forest lands, that's really an FMP issue uh, uh, for us. And we'll be discussing that shortly. Uh, that transitions then, of course, into the implementation plans and the AOPs uh, in turn to, uh, to, to address that goal. Thank you. Does that answer the question, Greg? Yes, yeah, so I just forgot to mention that um, I'm uh, the environmental representative on the State Forest Advisory Committee by way of introduction. Thank you. Thank you. And Craig Patterson? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm Craig Patterson. I'm a grandfather and been involved in forestry issues for over 50 years. And my question is about, you You mentioned the, the greatest permanent value, uh, triple bottom line. And when you, but you've always been thin in talking about the economics and social aspects of the rural communities where the trees grow. Will you be addressing that this time? Yes, uh, you'll see it reflected in, in one of our goals in particular, and it is a goal around climate change. Um, and it really has to do with, you know, the context of it is, is a climate smart forestry, which involves not only the resilience of the forest itself, um, which is no small thing, uh, and carbon storage, but also uh, the tie to local communities um, and the social aspects uh, of that as well. Well, if I can just follow up real quickly, in past conversations with Mary Mitzos, who is the executive director of the National Forest Foundation, when I've asked her if she knows of any thriving rural forested communities anywhere in the country, she was honest and said no. And I know I've lived in the rural forested communities for 47 years now in McKenzie Bridge. And I worked in a lumber mill with my grandfather 54 years ago. So I know what it's like. And it seems like that the rural communities continually suffer increasingly and no, it never gets addressed. I would like to see it be addressed. Thank you. Sylvia, maybe I'll just jump in if I could. This is Liz Dent, State Forest Division Chief, and Craig, really appreciate the question. Um, it is uh, definitely part of greatest permanent value, and uh, one of the ways, uh, and so we take it very seriously, and there are several ways that uh, I would offer that State Forests um, provide support to rural communities. Uh, one is timber related jobs and timber economies um, that are provided from our harvesting. Um, revenue that's distributed to the counties, uh, uh, rural schools and local taxing districts helps to support those rural communities. Uh, quality of life uh, afforded by having um, healthy, resilient forests around those communities. So I think there's a number of ways um, that we are currently um, providing some support towards those communities to thrive. And, and I would just close by saying it has always been kind of a challenge to um, come up with a metric that speaks to that um, more holistically, sort of you know, community well being, and as you put it, thriving rural communities. Those are some ways we can kind of tick off what we're able to provide, but there certainly is more work to be done there. So appreciate the question. Uh, thanks, Liz, and thanks, Craig. And a lot of these recent comments are really getting into some of those core values that are integrated into the um, forest management plan draft goals. So it seems like we could get into that now. 
um, and that might help uh, address some of these questions and comments as well. But maybe Pamela, did you have a question on the FMP process or update before we get into that? Actually, uh, I was wondering how the greatest personal value was acted on the slide in Astoria by clear cutting that forestry place up there. It blocked Route 30 and a lot of people couldn't get to work or emergency vehicles couldn't pass through. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Right. And Liz, uh, an answer, I think Pamela, you're wanting an answer to that question, right? Just want to make sure rather than it wasn't just a statement. Yes, I want to know because it, the okay. Department of Transportation had to take and, and I wondered if you made any profits on that. So um, you start off with greatest permanent value and um, the in really a very sort of crass summary, if you will, gross summary of greatest permanent value, it is to provide social, economic, and environmental benefits um, over time and across the landscape to Oregonians. And that's in the context of a working forest. So you, you start off with greatest permanent value, that, that's this holistic approach. Um, as far as the landslide that occurred there, um, I am not, uh, I don't have the information in front of me to talk about specifically what happened and what were the management practices around that. We do have a series of specific management strategies and specific actions that are characterized in our annual operating plans uh, for minimizing the risk of landslides and debris flows or certainly the interaction between those and any of our harvest activities. So we do very specific on the ground work on that. So that that's in towards that question, as far as uh, any uh, harvesting that took place as a follow-up to that because of impacts on the roads, um, I believe, it, and then you're referencing ODOT um, actions there, I, I really can't answer that question. I'm, I don't know how that played out for them. Do you employ geologists? We do. We have, um, their title is geotechnical engineers and they do all the evaluations of well it was on the Astoria formation which is notoriously a very unstable formation here in Astoria yeah thank you yeah you're welcome thank you for the question thank you well, I'm going to turn it back over to Mike and Sarah to get into a review of the draft goals for the forest management plan, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. And I think Sarah and Mike will also explain that really the purpose today is to provide the information on these draft goals and make sure that clarifying questions get answered. And then there will be a follow-up survey and opportunity to get into discussion at a follow-up meeting next week. So today is really making sure everyone understands what these goals say so that you can provide um, your written comment in the survey. And Mike, I will turn it back over to you. Thank you. Um, okay, so getting into the goals, uh, draft goals. So the forest management plan contains goals for a broad variety of forest resources. And some of these goals, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the ones for wildlife and aquatic species have considerable overlap with the HCP while others have less. Um, so in this respect, the FMP and HCP complement one another, but then the FMP has to address uh, many other things. So I think what we'll do here is just start walking through the goals uh, one by one and, um, and let you have a look at them, okay. So uh, also I should say, when we look at these over on the left-hand side in green, uh, you will see the forest resource for which the goal uh, has been established. Uh, and then you'll see the draft goal uh, in the white text. So for forest health, the goal is to ensure healthy, sustainable and resilient forest ecosystems that over time help achieve environmental, social and economic goals to benefit all Oregonians. 
Next. For climate change, we want to lead by example in demonstrating climate smart forest management that supports climate adaptation, mitigation, and the achievement of forest resource goals. For wildfire, we want to mitigate the risk of wildland fire effects on forest production, wildlife habitat, landscape function, and to support the wildfire resilience of local communities. For wildlife, we want to maintain, protect, and enhance functional and resilient systems and landscapes that provide the variety and quality of habitat types and features necessary for long-term persistence of native wildlife species. And while we're on this slide, this is an example of where the HCP will form the strategies of the FMP for the covered species. And also by default, several other late seral uh, forest species. But there are other uh, mid and early seral uh, forest species that the FMP will have to address that are not addressed by the HCP. Okay. Aquatics and riparian. Two goals here, one associated with species and the other associated with drinking water. The first, maintain, protect, and restore dynamic, resilient, and functioning aquatic habitats that support the life history needs of a full range of aquatic and riparian dependent fish and wildlife species. And the second, maintain and protect forest drinking water sources that provide high quality drinking water for private and public domestic use. Pollinators and invertebrates provide suitable habitats across the landscape that contribute to maintaining or enhancing native, sensitive, and endangered pollinator and invertebrate populations. For plants, maintain understory vegetation representing a diversity of native vegetation associations and seral stages across the landscape, including sensitive and endangered plant populations. For timber production goals, one is provide sustainable and predictable production of forest products that generate revenues and jobs for benefit of the state, counties, local taxing districts, and communities. And also specific to common school forest lands to manage those lands to secure the greatest permanent value to the people of the state of Oregon and generate long-term revenues to the common school fund. For forest carbon, the goal is to contribute to Oregon's carbon stores within state forest lands. And as a note on this slide, during the September board meeting, uh, the Board of Forestry will be considering ODF's Climate Change and Carbon Plan, which is an overarching document. And those discussions will certainly help us inform this goal further. Next slide. Air quality, maintain and protect he healthy air quality standards. For soil, maintain, protect, and enhance soils. Recreation, education, and interpretation. The first goal, provide high quality forest REI opportunities to create meaningful and enjoyable experiences which foster appreciation and understanding of forests and contribute to community health, forest stewardship, and economic well being. And also to manage REI infrastructure and recreational use in an environmentally sustainable manner that seeks to minimize adverse impacts to natural resources and forest ecosystems. For our transportation system, we seek to manage the transportation system to facilitate the anticipated activities in a manner in which, which provides for resource protection, transportation efficiency, safety, and sound fiscal management. For scenic values, manage forests in a way that value scenery, 
and forested settings that are visually appealing. For special forest products, provide opportunities to obtain special forest products. For mining, agriculture, administrative sites, and grazing, permit those activities when resource use is compatible with other forest goals. The cultural goals are still under, uh, currently they are still under development. Um, and we are, um, <clears throat> sorry, we're currently engaging with the tribes uh, to fully understand their desired goals uh, for those ancestral lands that we currently manage. So that wraps up the goals that we currently have drafted and are looking for comment on. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to Sarah to let you know how to engage in that feedback process. Thank you, Mike. So with the introduction to the goals complete, I'd like to provo provide more details on how you can provide your written comment on the draft FMP goals. The project team has developed a quick 15 minute survey to gain an understanding of your level of support for each of the draft goals and to collect your written comments. The link to the survey is provided here and will be emailed out tomorrow as a follow-up to this meeting. The link will also be provided on the ODF Companion FMP website, which was provided in the chat at the beginning of this meeting. Written comments may also be provided to me via email, but please note that the survey is the preferred method for providing your feedback. Your feedback is very important to us and we look forward to hearing from you on these draft goals. So before we wrap up our FMP update, I do wanna close um, our presentation out today with some key dates and also the next steps that the project team will be taking. So next week on August 18th, there will be a joint stakeholder meeting where the objective will be to discuss the draft FMP goals. On August 27th, the project team will present the final, or excuse me, the draft goals to the FTLAC and will be seeking committee feedback. And uh, highlighted in green here on this slide is the September 8th deadline for written input. So all input external to the agency uh, will be due on September 8th. And the survey link will become inactive after that point. So please ensure that you get your written comments to us before that date. Um, we're also currently working to schedule meetings open to the public and a joint stakeholder meeting uh, in mid-October, as mentioned earlier on the timeline slide. And then lastly, um, we do have the November 3rd scheduled Board of Forestry meeting um, on the slide here, where we will be presenting um, an update on the project, as well as the draft goals, the revised draft goals, so with input incorporated. And then lastly, the next step for the project team, um, this will just be a brief high level update on where we're going next. Um, the team will be begin strategy development or has begun strategy development um, to pair and support the, the draft goals. Um, we'll also be uh, completing our data prep for our model um, work. We'll be conducting our calibration and scenarios, and then we'll be preparing our modeling outcomes analysis report, um, which we'll be submitting to the board in 2022. So with that, I will uh, conclude the FMP update and we'll turn it back over to Sylvia. All right, thank you, Mike and Sarah, for that overview of the goals um, and kind of the context for next steps on those pieces. And so you'll see in the chat, there's a link to the draft goals PDF. So you can kind of see them all in one place. It's sometimes helpful to just have the words in front of you um, and a link to the survey for providing further input on the goals. Um, and I also just, before we open it up to questions, just following up on Sarah's um, announcement of that August 18th meeting for, for a joint, joint stakeholder meeting on the draft goals. Folks that have been engaged already in the Habitat Conservation Plan and Forest Management Plan effort have gotten an invitation to that. Um, with this process, our process is typically that we have these meetings open to the public that are just distributed widely to the um, FMP and HCP 
listservs for anyone to, to come and really hear at a high level what's going on. And then we have stakeholder meetings to really dive into the details with a group that's really interested in engaging. So if you want to be invited to that meeting, please, let, and you haven't already, um, please let us know. You can just send a chat message to Aaron Bothwell is probably the easiest way with your email address. Or if you want to decide later, just send an email to um, Sarah or Cindy or Jason, we'll, we'll all get that information um, and make sure that you're part of the, of the list to get those invites. Um, so with that, I'll open it up to any questions that people have on the goals, but I also see that maybe Liz had something she wanted to add before we keep going here. Thank you, Sylvia. Liz Dent here, again, State Forest Division Chief, and I just thought I'd add a few words to wrap up um, Mike and Sarah's nice presentation. Um, I think it's obvious, but just in case we're rolling out, P, you know, portions or content, as Sarah said, of the FMP, and the goals are the broadest based, highest level um, basis for the more specific strategies that explain kind of how we're gonna get there. And so I think it can be natural to kind of look at these goals and think, where's the specificity? That's a um, understandable question. Just wanted to get the message across that that is the intent for these to be pretty high level. We still wanna you know, hear, have the full dialogue, whatever it is that you wanna share with us, but did want to mention that more, de you know, more detailed approaches to getting our work done on state forests is, is being developed in those strategies. So it can be a little confusing that we're putting a piece out at a time, but they do build on each other. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks, Liz. All right, I see we have a question from Doug Cooper. Uh, hi, thanks, uh, Sylvia. Doug Cooper with Hampton Lumber. So Liz, you um, hit the nail on the head there. I mean, reviewing the goals from the current draft, I mean, these are extraordinarily basic in general. And so when would you expect to provide the more detail of the strategies then? Because, I mean, these are, there are no measures or metrics included with these goals. It's, so what else uh, might we expect to see and when? Hi, Doug, this is Sarah. I can answer that question. Um, we will be sharing the strategies that are currently under development with the project team, um, likely in late September, um, or October. So in preparation, you should receive those in advance of those October uh, meetings that I mentioned on the timeline. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Doug. Any other questions or clarifications that people need on the draft goals or the process for getting input on the goals? All right, I see a question from Mesa Miller. Hey there, thank you so much. Yeah, I have a couple questions. Um, I noticed with the plant section of the goals, y'all basically um, specified understory species, but I didn't see anything about like actual overstory tree species that provide like habitat for sensitive species that will be trying to protect through this plan. So if I could have a comment about trees in general. And also, um, I just want a clarification about how the management plan is related to the Forest Practices Act and if they are related. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, so uh, specifically, uh, so uh, some of those goals, and I, I forgot to mention this, uh, some of the goals we were looking at there are required in the planning rule uh, that, we, that we deal with, our forest management plan. There's a certain number of, of those that are just uh, line items, and then there's a few that we added, and uh, pollinators and forest carbon and things like that um, are, are some of those goals. Plants are a goal. Uh, or I'm sorry, a forest resource that we have to address by the planning rule. And specifically that is intended to be those non-tree species. Our tree species are addressed through uh, both the wildlife habitat goals across the landscape and also by the uh, uh, forest product, the timber production goals. 
And those things together, the strategies will speak to the mix of tree species um, that we have out there and the different pathways of development that they will have. Um, specifically, uh, one thing that has been added um, in, the, in the climate change piece, we're being, uh, there's a couple of different pieces there. And one is of course, carbon sequestration and storage. And the other is simple forest resiliency. Uh, so it really speaks to the forest health uh, goal as well. Obviously, all these uh, goals are, are intertwined. Um, and, and in that, there are also uh, tree species considerations. As climate does change, and we have to deal with uh, species that may, not no, may no longer be growing well on sites, uh, how can we help them grow the best they can? How can we pick the sites that we, we still are growing our traditional species on? Where do we need to facilitate uh, migration of species uh, so that we don't just have forest failure, that sort of thing? Um, so the tree species are, but the tree species still will primarily be discussed in the wildlife, uh, climate, and uh, also the uh, uh, timber production uh, goals as well as pollinators uh, and invertebrates, uh, of course, in those uh, early serial types to support those uh, species. And then with your question about whether or not it's related to the Forest Practices Act, um, it is in the sense that all forest operations on non-federal lands in the state of Oregon are you know, subject to the Forest Practices Act. Um, our FMP, uh, generally speaking, goes above and beyond uh, the Minimum Forest Practices Act standards uh, for most uh, resources. Thank you so much. Um, just a quick follow-up. Um, I know that we're going to get more into details as the months go on, but um, just quickly, are you all kind of considering like uh, longer rotations and like larger trees being conserved for those endangered and Garden species that need like large habitat in the canopies and basically trees 80 or 150 years and older? Yes, uh, we are certainly. Um, with our HCP uh, as the primary example of uh, where those uh, sorts of habitats will be located, um, our habitat conservation plan has a time horizon of 70 years and we have a large uh, we have a large acreage uh, involved in those HCAs. They are not management free. Um, there are several uh, uh, areas where we would go in and treat stands to better the habitat outcomes, uh, including uh, healthy conifer management, uh, basically density management to uh, enhance the growth of those trees. And then there are some areas where we have some uh, disease problems where we need to go in and basically reestablish a stand that will grow better over that 70 years than the current stand uh, would. So yes, uh, those are primarily being, being addressed there. There's also components on the landscape in the HCP outside of HCAs that focus on residual trees um, and, and so for the green tree retention that we'll be doing that are intended to foster uh, larger trees um, across the landscape uh, as well. Um, in addition to that, there's our riparian conservation areas, which are of course uh, also across the landscape um, where you'll see that sort of uh, feature develop over time. Okay, thank you. And Laura Wilkinson. Hi, Laura Wilkinson with Hampton Lumber. Um, I've got a bunch of questions and comments about all of these, but I'll stick to one to two um, and wait till the 18th. But the first one I just wanna clarify. So on the second timber production goal, it specifically mentions common school fund lands. Um, I'm just curious of why you're specifically calling out just those lands and not border forestry lands or border forestry lands inherently a part of all of these goals. So yeah, they are, they are inherently part of all of the goals. And really the common school forest lands are as well in their own way. Um, that is called out separately to just to recognize sort of the somewhat different economic driver, uh, if you will, associated with the common school forest lands, just because they are a, a type of common school land 
um, and and where those revenues are supposed to go. And there's just a slightly different uh, twist there. So it's really to to honor that different uh, objective for those lands. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. And then on the pollinators and invertebrates one, so I, I don't know how well aware ODF is in, um, in the project that we're doing with Oregon State on planting flowers and different um, plants that are um, that pollinators like. And so that's something that we've been doing on the lands that we've recently harvested. So um, I would look into that model and I can provide more information on that if that's something that you guys are interested in. Yeah, we'd really appreciate having further discussions on that. I know that we provided some sites uh, for uh, uh, Matt Betts' uh, study, I believe it is, um, in some places. And uh, yeah, I think we should definitely have some follow-up conversations about that. Thanks. Cool. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. And Amanda. Yeah, thanks, guys. Uh, similar to Laura, I will provide many more comments in uh, in my formal comment letter. But uh, just one quick uh, question. So I see that you've got kind of the climate change goal, but then you've all, that's going to tie into the CCCP, but then also the forest carbon goal, which is separate and in addition to the climate change goal. Uh, you specifically call out carbon um, stored in state lands. Uh, but what's uh, missing here that the department has done a lot of work on is carbon stored in the forest, the harvested wood products pool as well. Um, so obviously some of that will be tied into the timber production goal, uh, but it's not specifically called out. And I just wanna make sure that we're being holistic in, um, in the goal setting related to climate change and carbon. So uh, not, not just looking at it from one side of the spectrum, but the multitude of benefits and social benefits that we get from um, managing through climate smart forestry, doing sustainable harvests and actually storing wood in, uh, in uh, long lived wood products as well. So just wanna make sure that that's being captured. Uh, and then just generally, this is a real general question, uh, recognizing that all we have to go off is if, off of is these very high level goals right now. Uh, what is the best um, uh, input that you you can get right now? I don't want to get too specific if that is more for uh, the strategies. Um, I'm just trying to understand what is most helpful for you guys in you know as we comment on these goals. So, you know, I, I, first of all, I'll say I think any comment uh, is helpful, um, you know, that, that kind of frames up what you value in the plan uh, is really important. Um, I don't want people to be too worried about how specific or how general they might be. Um, it may be something that does end up being reflected more in a strategy uh, than in a goal, or maybe it ends up being uh, really addressed in uh, a metric uh, in that, which could end up being a performance measure in the plan, um, or it could end up being in the adaptive management plan or something like that. But regardless, um, we'll be able to track where, where that ends up. So I wouldn't be, you know, I would just say, go ahead. Um, if, you know, if you want to be specific, be specific, and that's fine. We'll capture that and, uh, and track it along the way. Um, and hopefully, you know, uh, always, if you don't see it represented somewhere uh, in how we've addressed it, then, then uh, you know, bring it, bring it back to our attention. We'll be happy to, happy to make sure that happens. All right. Be careful what you wish for, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. And Trigvi. Oh. Thank you, Mike, for your reference to management based on an older, a longer rotation length, such as 70 years. But what that immediately brings to mind for me is the recent significant group of OSU research papers published in important literature, which emphasize the value of even older forests than that. Uh, you know, the 80 to 150 year, 50 year time frame in relation to water production, uh, and also the very large efficiency of those old forests for carbon storage versus logging and getting some kind of more transient storage in uh, timber products. 
So uh, what is the degree to which there is a focus on actually trying to work toward a goal that includes the benefits of that really important research that's come out of OSU in the last few years? Yeah, thanks for that. So that um, so first of all, I'll, I'll go back and when I was speaking of the HCP term of uh, being 70 years, um, a lot of the stands uh, that we have in the HCAs currently uh, are whatever age they are. Um, you know, some of them are well over 120 um, and, you know, some are fairly young, uh, you know, including recent harvests. So there's going to be a variety of stands there. There will certainly be actually quite a, quite a lot of stands that grow into those uh, uh, much older um, uh, categories that you're talking about. The other thing that we're looking at, um, you know, just in terms of the management in general, and a lot of this may be answered with the, with the habitat conservation areas in terms of carbon storage and, and what we do. But uh, when we look at prescriptions into the future and how do we want to manage uh, the forest? And so everything is, is part of this. The economics is part of it, the wildlife habitat, um, water quality, and then, you know, what sort of, uh, what sort of harvested wood products are we going to get out of a stand? Because different wood products have different lifespans, uh, you know, uh, in terms of how they're utilized, uh, and then just, you know, in terms of how long they last. Um, so all of those things do become a factor uh, in the, in the uh, equation. And what we're really looking to do, you know, with GPV is strike that, strike that balance for the landscape as a whole, for the forest management plan area uh, as a whole. So not every silvicultural prescription would see the maximization or optimization of uh, carbon stored uh, in the wood products that are harvested from it. Um, but across the landscape, we are looking for that, that benefit. Thank you. Great, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and Jason, I think Jason has his hand up on behalf of a uh, participant here. Yeah, um, and so um, I had uh, Nancy ask me a couple of questions in the uh, chat through a direct message, and I'm hoping uh, she might be able to pop on and kind of clarify because I'm having trouble tracking the context. Uh, one was about tree age in terms of stands, and the other was um, due to dire wildfire circumstances at present, are you able to share specific recommendations to appropriate entities or not? And um, I'm hoping she might be able to, did, does that give you guys enough to answer that question or? I think I can take a stab at it based on that. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll take the second one first, if, if that's okay. And, and really what I'm trying to do is <clears throat> um, when, it, when it comes to the wildfire protection strategies, um, it, it is you know, gonna be something that plays out at different scales, uh, depending on the situation. So there is that wildlife, uh, sorry, wildfire urban interface, um, residential interface, direct threat. Uh, to, to structures and to people and, and so forth. So, uh, and in those, uh, you know, we're looking into how we fit in with wildland urban interface work and with the uh, um, community wildfire protection programs. And so that might lead to some very specific targeted actions. Within the FMP, we would, you know, for instance, the strategy might simply be to uh, utilize those resources to develop uh, the, our plans going forward and where you would actually see real uh, plans of, oh, we're going to treat these acres um, over this time frame that would show up in an implementation plan and then individual operations would show up in an annual operations plan. So that's kind of how that piece uh, plays out. In terms of tree ages, um, I, you know, uh, we look at a variety of tree ages. We don't typically set a rotation age, if you will, uh, for our stands under our management. And so some of them will get older 
um, as I've been saying, uh, some of them will not get will not get uh, quite as old. Um, you know, they may be harvested for a variety of a variety of reasons. Um, but within that, there's going to be, of course, different fuels uh, loading develop as well, and that becomes more of a, a general landscape uh, management issue for us. So where we have stands that are developing, um, but they are eventually going to be commercially harvested. Those stands will typically uh, see uh, commercial thinning entries and other things that result in, in some reduction of fuel loading um, and, and make them somewhat more fire resilient in that uh, context. Within our habitat conservation areas, um, where we're you know, principally stands are just going to be growing. Um, we still have to figure out the implementation of those as well. There is language in the HCP that allows for fuels management, although fuels management is not the focus, uh, focus there. So there's a variety of strategies really at the landscape and the local level uh, uh, to speak uh, to, those, to those things. And I, I don't know, uh, you can let me know if I didn't answer your question. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Nancy. <laughs> All right, and over to Greg Jacob. Question for Michael. You mentioned that within the HCAs, there will be some management, and I assume that will include thinning, but will it also involve clear cuts or modified clear cuts? It will. Under the current strategy, um, as drafted in the uh, HCP, we have, we have three main categories of management. And uh, one is for healthy conifer stands. Um, they're there, they're fine, but maybe they're 30 or 40 years old and they're not especially diverse. And so there will be a focus on trying to promote uh, those stands to things like variable density thinning and other forms of partial cutting to try and promote uh, and accelerate the development of those trees into larger trees and you know better habitat and so forth, as well as reinitiating understory and, and those types of things. Um, there are two situations in which we would clear cut stands and um, these don't end up looking like your typical uh, clear cut. Um, <clears throat> one are Swiss needle cast stands. Uh, in which we've got severe or moderate Swiss needle cast that has basically slowed the stand to almost nothing. Um, and we believe that those stands can actually be replaced by something that will grow into something better during the habitat. Uh, I mean, sorry, during the permit term of the HCP. Um, in those stands, you know, if it's, if it's not Swiss needle cast infected Douglas fir, we're going to be retaining conifer, you know, the other conifer species, hardwood species, and, and so forth, uh, to try and really work with, work with the best of what we have in those situations. The other situation are, uh, is where we have red alder dominated areas with very little conifer component. Um, now, I don't, I don't want to set the wrong tone here. We're not on a mission to eliminate red alder, not, not by any means or any other form of hardwood on the landscape. But we do have uh, a large number of acres, uh, especially in, on our Tillamook district. Um, I think most people are aware we just have these huge swaths of alder. And so we will be going in and taking some of those, and there'll be plenty left, but where we can get to them and where it's feasible, removing the alder component. Again, keeping other hardwoods, keeping conifer, uh, conifer species that may be present, um, and so on and so forth. The way that pencils out over the first uh, 30 years of the HCP permit term is that we would be managing in up to 45,000 acres uh, of partial cutting in those, um, in those uh, uh, otherwise healthy conifer stands to promote habitat, and then uh, managing, um, I believe it's, help me out here, Nick, is it 15,000 acres each? 15 and 15, yeah. 15,000 acres each of those uh, Swiss needle cast and red alder. Uh, stands. Yeah, thanks, Mike and Greg. And since we're getting into questions on the HCP, 
maybe we should move into that topic unless there are any other questions on the FMP or clarifications on the goals here. Perfect. Okay. Oh, maybe Doug, did you have a FMP question? Yeah, just quick clarification on the goals then. So even looking at the first two, forest health and climate change, there's reference to achieving other goals. And so does that mean to say that uh, the department currently has other goals that these goals are intended to achieve? And if you do have them, could you point us to them? Uh, thanks, Doug. Yeah, no, that specifically is in reference to the other goals listed there in the plan. So that would say there's an economic goal for under forest health? Absolutely, absolutely. It's all about maintaining the resilience of those of the forest so that we can produce all those other goals uh, that were listed there. Okay, thanks. Sylvia, it looks yeah. like Ron Byers has a, a question. He's been raising his hand. Just a quick question. Well, at some point you identify um, projects that would be ripe for alternatives to pesticides um, and look at um, not only uh, the feasibility, but the cost analysis of doing so. Yes, so um, as a specific goal in that regard, uh, that does not exist at this time. Um, however, operationally, we are constantly considering the sort of management um, that's best applied to the site. And we always try to be, you know, um, fairly judicious uh, with our objectives and our use of chemicals. But increasingly, we do look at uh, one of the hot topics uh, these days, of course, is early seral habitat complexity. Um, and so there is a balance there between reforestation objectives and uh, other types of vegetation to support things like pollinators um, and, the, and, and other species. I see Robbie Lefebvre has popped on here. So I think I'm gonna ask him to provide a much better answer than I can on that. Hey, uh, Robbie Lefebvre, I'm assistant to the area director, but in my former role, I was a reforestation coordinator. Um, so doing that over the last five years. We do look at every stand um, and not every stand gets sprayed. And, you know, for example, in Astoria last year, uh, we did very little uh, chemical application. And it's really about timing for us too. Um, and if we have the right timing when the logging operation is done, we can get away without chemical. And we've been really successful at it. And with, we have a pretty limited uh, approach anyway to it. And we're, we're really just targeting kind of those shrubs, uh, specifically blackberry and scotch broom are our biggest problems and Himalayan blackberry. So both are, of them are invasives. And so we go after those, that way we can get the trees planted and we just get them that established that first year and we do very little spring release. So that allows all the annuals to come back and all those pollinator species that we, uh, the bees like. So, you know, we're a pretty light approach on what we do and every unit is evaluated. We do not have a blanket herbicide approach to every unit that we, we uh, harvest. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Okay, great. Thanks for all those questions on the FMP and the goals. And um, of course, we'll be following up with more information on the survey to provide your input on the goals moving forward. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Troy Ramick to give us an update on the Habitat Conservation Plan. And then also Terry O'Rourke will provide some information on the NEPA process for the HCP. Troy, over to you. Great, thanks, Sylvia. And can you see the slides? I assume you yep. can. Great, thanks. Uh, hi again, everybody. Troy Ramick with ICF. Um, as I mentioned at the top, I'm uh, the project manager for the, the technical consultants that are supporting ODF on the HCP process. Um, so, just a, a brief update today. Um, we, you know, the intention of this meeting was to largely spend time on the, the forest management plan, and, and uh, Mike and Sarah have done that. But we did want to, because we had you all here, um, 
and you've mostly been following along with this HCP process for the last couple of years, wanted to just give you a little bit of an update of what's happening with the HCP right now, because it has been a little quiet relative to the last um, year or so. Uh, so um, we will hear from Terry O'Rourke in a minute uh, to give us just a brief update on the NEPA process. That is largely what is um, underway right now um, within the within sort of the, the NEPA side of the planning process. But um, but there is a little bit happening on the HCP as well. And so I'll give you just a few slides on that. Um, but before I do that, I just want to, um, you know, not assuming that everybody's sort of been along with us uh, from the beginning here, just a quick reminder of, of where we are in the process with the HCP. So, um, you know, over the last, like I said, last couple of years, the focus of, of the work that ODF and, and the consultant team uh, has been doing has been on developing the, the Habitat Conservation Plan. And um, we worked uh, really through the early part of this year uh, and uh, produced an administrative draft of the Habitat Conservation Plan um, that's been referenced a few times today. And that administrative draft HCP is, um, I, I like to refer to it as a complete and stable version of the HCP. And that's important because we wanted to get it to a place through our work with the scoping team, you know, the, the state and federal agencies that are on the scoping team that the NEPA analysis could begin. And so we did that um, again the early part of this year. The administrative draft was posted on the ODF website um, in March uh, of this year. And that administrative draft is what the, um, the NEPA team um, that uh, is, is being led by uh, NOAA Fisheries is looking at and, and is analyzing. Um, it is a large document if you haven't looked at it. Uh, and so a couple of things I wanted to point out as well, if you if you go to the ODF website and the, the link is at the bottom of the page and you may have been there already, there's a, a, a bunch of information on that website. Um, but the, the draft document is there for your eyes if you're interested in that. There is at the beginning of that administrative draft, a uh, basically an executive summary, like a 13 page executive summary. So if you don't want to take the deep dive, into the whole document, you can certainly see, um, you, know, you can get the gist in the executive summary. Um, and there are a few other tools on the, on the website that will be useful if you're interested. Um, there is a document, there's a link to a document that is a summary of changes that occurred uh, between the draft of the HCP that was circulated last, uh, uh, last fall in October of 2020 and this March 2021 version. So if you're if you were looking at it last year and you haven't looked at it in a while and you want to just a quick snapshot of what changed, that document is there. Um, there is also a link on the right-hand side um, under work products to a document that is called HCP Key Elements. Um, that is an even more abbreviated snapshot and version of what's in the, in the plan. So a couple different ways to access the information if you haven't looked at it yet, um, uh, including the entire document. So just, just a note for everybody in case you're kind of stepping into the process for the first time uh, here today. Um, and so uh, while the, the NEPA process is playing out, uh, we have been doing a little work on the HCP and um, mostly what that's consisted of, uh, again, we our, our idea was to get the HCP to a stable place so the NEPA analysis could occur. So you know, we're not um, we're not doing major work on the HCP. There aren't any major sort of changes underway at this point in time. But what we are doing is um, helping ODF go through uh, basically an, an operational review of the HCP. So um, this is really a series of of uh, question and answer sessions with district staff about the HCP and providing um, all ODF you know staff the opportunity to read the document and provide comments or or recommendations for modifications. Um, and the HCP, we knew uh, when we started the process that we would have this period of time where, you know, work sort of paused on the HCP while the NEPA process um, played out. And so we, we wanted, we knew from the beginning we would want to take advantage of this time to get ODF district staff um, to really review it and, and really begin to think about, you know, how, how to put this HCP on the ground. You know, is, is it operationally um, you know, feasible, does it make sense? Are there any, you know, clarifications that need to be made in the document? So it's a, it's a really uh, useful exercise and a good use of everybody's time right now. So that's what we're doing. Um, we are making some updates to the HCP in response to those comments. Um, those updates are being worked through the scoping team, just like, you know, all of the HCP work uh, has been uh, in the past. Um, of course, the HCP was developed with the support of the scoping team. So we're continuing that process. 
the updates are generally focused on, um, like I said, those that will facilitate better implementation. Um, the, the, the people that are reviewing it now are those that are going to be asked to, you know, to do what the HCP says. And so we are, you know, we're very deliberately asking the question, um, does this make sense to you? Uh, and they're telling us if it doesn't or if it's, you know, if it could be worded a little bit more clearly or, uh, or, or what have you. And so we are working on that. Um, also looking for just, um, you know, there's a lot of, some are, some are um, existing standards um, that ODF already uses, but there's also a lot of new standards and a lot of new management direction that will come out of the HCP. So, you know, some things will be done differently under the HCP than has been done in the past. And, and we talk about those in various places in the HCP. And so we're, we're striving all the time for consistency in how that information is presented. And so this operational re review has been very helpful to identify situations where maybe we say it two different ways in two different places and we need to just kind of tighten that up a little bit. Um, so that's an example of, of one thing that's happening. Uh, and in other, other situations, um, it really comes down to definitions. So um, we have an entire chapter, if you're familiar um, in the HCP, chapter three is a, the covered activities chapter where we describe you know, the activities that are essentially covered by the permit. Uh, and in some cases, we just need to clarify some definitions of things. Um, we, um, you know, we, we maybe meant one thing um, and people are interpreting it a little bit differently. And so we just need to, again, tighten up the language there a little bit. And just to give you a, a little flavor of some of those types of changes, and again, this isn't a, a complete list of the work that's happening, but wanted to just give you a sense of the, the kinds of things that um, we've been working on. Um, I mentioned clarifying language and covered activities. That's where probably most of the focus has been, I would say, um, during this operational review. Um, and just as an example, you know, we describe um, landings as a cover activity um, in that chapter, in chapter three. And we've just been updating the, the definition of how we, how we define landings. Um, we're, we're, uh, we are broadening it a little bit. We had missed a few things that actually occur out there that we wanted to make sure that we were capturing. Similarly with quarries and borrow sites, we had just defined that um, probably more narrowly before in, in the original version um, than was appropriate based on how operations actually um, occur on the ground. And so we have expanded that definition a little bit um, to make it more, more appropriate and more accurate with, with ODF's actual work. Um, and then uh, this, this is, a, I think, a good one. In the covered activities chapter, um, where basically the intention there is to describe the activities, um, what are they, you know, what's covered. Um, and, and in some cases, we go a little beyond that and we actually talk about, you know, not just what is the activity, but, but how will it be done? How will it be completed on the ground? And, and in doing so, um, we often create new standards or it will be done this way or that way, you know, to minimize effects on our covered species. Uh, and um, a good request by the operational staff to actually move that kind of language into the conservation strategy chapter, chapter four, where all of the conservation actions occur or are listed so that, you know, during implementation, you're really basically looking in, in one chapter or in one place for those uh, management activities or, 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 or management direction and not having to sort of, uh, you know, scavenge across several chapters. And so we are doing some work in that way just to little reorganization to make it a little bit easier to understand during implementation. I mentioned um, creating consistency on definitions in some cases. And, you know, one of the places just um, as an example is there is, if you remember, there's a requirement um, in the HCP and the conservation strategy to maintain um, at least 40% dispersal habitat for northern spotted owls outside of the habitat conservation areas. And um, we actually we, we have a, when we make that statement in the conservation strategy, we have a definition of, of what that means, um, but we actually talk about uh, dispersal habitat in a couple of different ways throughout the HCP. And so again, um, from an operational standpoint, there will be the need to actually track that requirement into the future. And so we wanna make sure that it's very clear what the requirement is and, and how we're defining dispersal habitat and so forth. And so just again, tightening up language and making sure that we're being consistent across the document. Uh, and then um, another another place where there's been some attention paid is um, clarifying the types of projects that will be funded by the conservation fund. So as you recall, there is 
Uh, one of the one of the um, concepts forward in the HCP is to create a conservation fund um, by retaining some of the revenue from timber sales and, and focusing it on conservation projects that will benefit the covered species. And um, just some you know request for some clarification for the types of projects that will qualify for those conservation fund dollars, um, and probably more specifically, what will not qualify. And um, you know, as you can imagine, the the conservation related work, well, most of the conservation related work that ODF does now is really ingrained with the timber harvest program. And there's a lot of uh, conservation projects that that come come out of the timber harvest program and, and are just sort of um, that are just built into those harvest contracts. Um, wood, wood placement, you know, in streams is a, an easy example there. And so there is a there it becomes at, at one point a little bit of a gray area of what is a conservation project and what is just you know, part of the overall timber um, harvest operations. And so seeking some clarification there. So we've updated the language in the conservation fund text um, just to make it um, more clear when those monies will be utilized. Um, so that's just that's just a, an, a, an example list. There are other things that are sort of similar that we've been working on. Um, one thing I'll note that as, as we've been going through this process is that, um, you know, as uh, as questions or comments emerge that require a change or an edit to the HCP. As I said earlier, we sort of were working that through the scoping team. And then if anything, um, if there's anything that is substantial enough that we think it might actually influence the NEPA analysis that is underway, we're making sure that that information is getting back, you know, through NOAA Fisheries back to the NEPA team uh, so that they, you know, kind of have the, the, the latest and greatest information. And there's not a lot of that, but um, but sometimes we just, you know, want to err on the on the safe side and make sure that we're not um, uh, not missing something there. So that is happening as well, so that we don't have to do any rework on the NEPA document down the road. Um, so I think that's the basically the update on the HCP. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Terry O'Rourke to give a little update on the NEPA process, and then we can do questions on both of those things um, together as needed. Thanks, Troy. So my name is Terry O'Rourke. I'm the NOAA Fisheries person leading the NEPA effort. And I just wanted to put out there that uh, there may be some questions that you have after this call. And if you want to contact me and have discussions about the NEPA process one-on-one -on -one or with a small group, I'll make myself available to do that. And perhaps someone from Kearns and West could put my email in the chat in case anyone wants to follow up. So the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, is the process used by federal agencies to make informed decisions. And for this HCP, we've decided to go with an environmental impact statement. And that's the most in-depth analysis of the NEPA process. So for this effort, NOAA Fisheries is the lead and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is a cooperating agency. And what that means is that both agencies will use the analysis to make decisions regarding the issuance of an incident, incidental take permit for the Habitat Conservation Plan. Um, many of you may be familiar with forestry NEPA that's done by Forest Service or BLM where they really have a huge amount of discretion to say, hey, tell us what you want to have happen on every acre. And that is part of the federal lands process that they go through. This is a very different NEPA analysis where we are focusing on ODF's proposed action and we will be analyzing the um, the proposed action will be creating alternatives based on feedback that we've gotten in the scoping process, but our focus is on do we issue the permit or do we not issue the permit? And so that is the focus of our decision. So our process began officially on March 8th with the publishing of the notice of intent to conduct an EIS. The scoping period was for 30 days. People asked for an extension, so we gave a two week extension. And all of the comments that were received uh, went through regulations.gov and they're published there if anybody wants to see them. We had a public meeting on March 31st and information about the process is available on both the NOAA and the ODF websites. 
So when we receive the scoping comments, we examine them in whole and in part and assess them. And based on those comments, we are developing alternatives. I would love to say that we have developed alternatives, but at this point, we're still doing modeling and gathering information to develop the alternatives. Um, none of the comments submitted were complete alternatives. So to fully embrace the comments, we considered literal suggestions that were um, given and then also what we thought were, was the intent behind the suggestions. Um, and we're currently diving deep on a lot of the questions and issues that arose in the scoping. Um, the draft EIS, which will be published sometime in early 2022, will include a summary of scoping comments, alternatives, and an analysis of the important topics like economics, ge geology and soils, environmental justice, and others. And um, at that time, we'll have another comment period for 45 days where we'll ask for a review and comment of the NEPA document. So just in summary, there are four kind of big batch uh, items in the NEPA process. There's the scoping, which is complete, the draft EIS, which should be out in early 2022, the final EIS, and then the record of decision. And Amanda asked earlier, and I hope I wrote this down correctly, um, if we, when we consider alternatives, if there's an alternative that's brought forward in the NEPA process, uh, could it be permitted? So um, we're looking at lots of different tweaks and different alternatives. Um, the bottom line is an alternative to move through the process needs to meet the purpose and need. If it doesn't, then it's eliminated from further review. Um, so that is where we're at with the consideration of alternatives. And I'm sure there are some questions. Thank you so much, Terry and Troy. Yeah, so we'll open it up to any questions on the HCP or NEPA process. Yeah, and Amanda, over to you. Yeah, thanks, probably no, no surprise there. Um, so that, that I think was the main question that I had, Terry. Thank you for uh, recollecting. <laughs> my question from you know almost an hour ago um so yeah i think that 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 makes sense to me of course if you're going to continue forward with an alternative it needs to meet the purpose and need of of the nepa i think that that makes a lot of sense to me i guess where the the follow-up question was for me is on the applicant um you know you because you, you guys are selecting and hopefully working with odf as the applicant on what those alternatives are um, but if you deem an alternative to be um, one that can continue to move through the process because it does meet the purpose and need, um, then is it ODF's, uh, does ODF have the option of choosing within that range of alternatives um, to, to move into the FMP, I guess? That's my, that's my question. Okay. So just to be clear, it's NOAA Fisheries that's developing the alternatives. And we are seeking input from ODF regarding modeling and whether or not something is technically or operationally feasible, but they are not selecting alternatives. In fact, they, they don't know what the alternatives are at this point to the NEPA process. So I just want to be really clear about that. As far as what will happen in the future, I think that's unknown, but I'll let ODF um, respond to that. My experience with this is that um, when we have a proposed action, if there are ideas or thoughts that come up in the NEPA process that would enhance the HCP, sometimes the, um, the agency will modify the proposed action. Sometimes they don't. It's just, it's, it's an optional process and ODF and the Board of Forestry are the ones who will receive a permit. So whatever comes out of the process, it must be there. It must be theirs. So. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that follow up. Yeah. Thank you, Terry. And just wanted to see if ODF had any follow up to that as well. I I could add just a a little bit to that, and um, in terms of changes that could be made in that context, um, the department would really wants the the board to consider the the draft EIS and to consider the public comment that goes along with that as well. Um, 
you know, is, is just part of the as part of the process. And if there's something within that range, uh, you know, that that would be acceptable without triggering a whole new thing, um, then the department would be looking to the board to direct us to, you know, implement uh, some change uh, and, and look at that sort of thing. So just, just from a process standpoint, that's how we would want to receive our direction as the applicant would be from the board. Thanks, Mike. All right, let's go to Commissioner Bangs and then Brett Bronscombe. Hi, yes. Um, so in the discussion regarding changes being made within the HCP, um, have there been any significant changes that have occurred within the HCP that would drastically change any of the financials that was submitted previously during the comparative analysis given to the Board of Forestry? Yeah, I'll take, uh, I'll take that question um, and Mike or somebody can follow up. I mean, I would say no. Um, so there have been, you know, no changes to the, no fundamental changes to the conservation strategies as they appear in the administrative draft um, in, you know, no, no changes to the HCAs or riparian conservation areas or anything like that that would influence the, the harvest base or anything. Um, so it's, I would say in terms of economics, no, there, there, there currently have not been any changes made that would influence that, um, unless, Mike, unless I'm overlooking something, but that, that's my assumption. Uh, you're, you're correct with that, Troy. I mean, uh, given, given the uh, sort of the scale that the modeling was done and, and the model rules that were employed, um, I don't think there's anything significant there either. Um, one thing, you know, with any changes in any of this cleanup, as, as Troy uh, mentioned, you know, we are, we will be circling back with the scoping team as a matter of process um, and running all that by them uh, as well. So um, there are currently, you know, we, we're currently going through the review, and cataloging things and, and such as that, but we have not implemented uh, changes at this stage. Um, excellent, thank you. And can I ask a follow-up then? Um, given that the HCP has devoted such a large amount of acreage towards the HCAs and a focus towards environmental goals, uh, will the areas outside of the HCAs have a focus on the greatest financial return in order to maintain balance? So that's where the, that is where the FNP uh, comes in. Um, and all of this, all of this process. Certainly, there is an economic focus outside of the HCAs and RCAs. Um, you know, uh, relatively speaking, of course, because there's not an economic focus within them. So certainly, there will be that economic focus there, and trying to provide, um, you know, some making sure we get the balance of GPV right uh, between the HCP strategies and the FMP. Um, and so that's really where we're that's at where we're at now with the FMP conversation and trying to get those those goals uh, correct and then also uh, metrics uh, associated with those. Although we're not to the metrics point yet. Good, excellent. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. And I do want to note we're about five minutes until our sort of end of the meeting and then we move into the informal discussion. I just wonder for folks that need to hop off at four o'clock, was it, would it be okay if we take the other hands after four o'clock and then just to do the next step so everyone's aware for people that have to hop off? Give me a head nod if that's okay. All right. Perfect. Um, then let's just do that for a second. I'll, I'll just pull up the next step slide, Troy, if you don't mind. Um, going back to the slides here. And a lot of these were covered already with, um, with Sarah's presentation, but just a reminder that after today's meeting, we'll be sending out a link to a survey to provide your comments on the FMP goals. And we asked for that input um, by September 8th so that ODF can use it to you know, update the draft of the goals and then be using those goals to develop the strategies that will support them. 
Um, and we also will have a joint stakeholder meeting on August 18th from two to five to really delve into more depth on those goals. And if you are interested in being invited to that meeting and haven't been already, then please just send a chat message to Aaron Bothwell here or um, email any of the project leads, Sarah Lathrop or Cindy Collin Matrix. Um, and then we also have future engagement planned. So a meeting open to the public in October, and we'll be getting back out to this group with dates for that meeting and a stakeholder meeting in October as well. And as Sarah um, described, there's also going to be a Board of Forestry meeting on November 3rd to present those draft goals and an update on the FMP. So those are the next steps. And I think the next slide just lists some of the project contact information. Um, as a reminder, and we can put that in the chat as well. And I'll turn it over to Liz for a quick closing, and then we can continue to take kind of questions and comments for the next hour. Yeah, thanks, Sylvia. So I um, am one of those people that has to drop off at four o'clock, so glad just to have a few minutes here. Uh, truly uh, appreciate people's uh, attention and interest in this work. Um, we have been getting some feedback already. That is really helpful. I do, I, you know, want to impart on everybody that the reason we're doing this outreach um, is so we can get that feedback and that we can improve these goals so that we're doing a better job of, of representing uh, Oregonians and our stakeholders and our county partners. Um, we're tracking all of this with our Board of Forestry. Uh, really wanting to put our best foot forward so that when we go to the Board of Forestry in November, uh, we've done our due diligence of uh, reaching out to the people that we serve. So um, we're here. We know it's not a perfect product. That's why we're here looking for your input. Um, so with that, I do have to run, which is unfortunate because I, I do think this next hour is always really helpful. Um, but appreciate it and take care, everybody. Great. Thank you, Liz. All right. Um, and then this, most of the team is available here to continue answering questions and chatting for um, the next hour. So we'll just keep going here with any questions. So Brett, it was over to you. Thanks, Sylvia. Uh, hi, everybody. Brett Brown's come with the Wild Salmon Center. So I guess if it's okay, there, there are two parts to this and they're related and it kind of uh, gets into how all the different pieces, the NEPA, the HCP, and the FMP fit together. Um, so on the, uh, the first question is on the, um, if ODF did want to modify the, the proposed alternative, um, when would that happen? Just so everybody's aware. And, and then how much time would that end or would that add potentially to the process? I mean, how much does NOAA need to go back and start the evaluation over again if there's a modification? I'm not sure. Is that maybe a Terry question? Boy, that's so speculative. I would speculate uh, <laughs> that we're going to do our best to have a reasonable range of alternatives. So any possible alternative could fit. But um, We'll, we'll see. I'll, I'll turn that back to Troy or ODF and, and see what you have to say. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, I think it's a good question, Brett. I think any changes, um, and, and Mike mentioned earlier that, you know, any changes to the proposed alternative or the, the you know, the HCP as drafted would come from, from the Board of Forestry. That would happen after the public draft stage for sure. So public comments would come in. Um, you know, the, everybody would see the analysis that was done on the range of alternatives, the comments would come in, and then there could be some conversations about whether or not any modifications to the proposed action would need to occur. Um, and the, the, as Terry mentioned, the benefit of having analyzed a, a range of alternatives is that if those, if any modifications do occur, if they're within that range of alternatives, then the NEPA analysis would still be adequate. Right, and so it wouldn't actually probably add too much time to the overall process. Um, if there's, you know, something sort of comes out of left field and is outside of those range of alternatives, that would require additional NEPA, NEPA analysis and would add a pretty good chunk of time to the overall timeline, um, which is why the alternative selection process is important. 
Uh, so um, I guess I think that answers the question. I think any changes that would come after the public draft, um, HCP and EIS are, are uh, out uh, for review. Um, and then any changes would also come at the direction of the board. Um, so there would be some timing related to that. Okay. And the, so then the other question is, um, I think I'll hold back on a lot of the comments, specific comments on the goals for the next meeting next week. And uh, I mean, in general, it feels like while a lot of time could probably be spent on wordsmithing goals, where um, I think the bulk of people want to, to get, um, or at least I'll speak for who I'm representing with the Wild Salmon Center, we, we'd like to get into the strategy part of this. Like, I think where the rubber really meets the road on, okay, here are the goals, but how is um, ODF and the FMP actually going to um, make commitments and, and, and adopt strategies that achieve those goals? And that strikes me as the really challenging part of this because some of the goals are intention. Um, not everything can be an equal priority on every acre on the landscape. And at the same time, all the stuff that's in the goals rolls up into the greatest permanent value analysis. So you kind of got to be thinking about all of it. So I get that it's complicated, but question is in the context of, um, I think on the last FMP revision go round, there was some talk of the revised FMP would be a more flexible document than the last go round, the last or, or maybe more typical FMPs have been. And, um, in the context of an HCP where there are specific commitments being made that affect conservation and, and harvest um, and other values too. There's I think there's tension between desires for flexibility and discretion and, and commitments. And so can somebody from ODF speak to how um, this FNP revision is kind of looking at that um, more flexibility kind of previous conversation or language around like we want more flexibility and how you balance that with um, commitments, especially related to the HCP. Yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, Brett. So I think really it is, um, you're right. That tension's always there. Uh, and mostly because you don't know the future, you don't know how you're going to manage every acre, right? So it can be kind of difficult. Um, one of the things that we benefit from this time that we didn't have in the last FMP are the HCP strategies themselves. So, you know, for instance, the riparian conservation areas uh, established in the HCPs and, and the, stra the uh, uh, standards for managing those that becomes you know, just incorporated directly into the FMP. We're probably not gonna regurgitate it there. It'll probably be incorporated by reference, but you know, there it is. And, and, and there's this uh, 70 year, what ends up being a 70 year contract with the federal services over here that has the high level of assurances. So hopefully that does a lot of the heavy lifting for us. The other things um, you know, may have greater or less uh, levels of specificity depending on what the goal is, what the forest resource we're addressing is, how much we know about it today, um, and how much we even know about how to adequately measure it today. Some of these things are a real challenge to, to, to measure, right? Uh, especially when we get to things like the REI goals and how, how are we measuring people's quality of engagement with the environment through our recreation and education interpretation program? So there's a, there's a whole variety of things there. Uh, and I, you know, really we do rely a lot on the implementation plans and we are trying to elevate the role of the implementation plans um, compared to where they have been historically. While those have always gone out for public comment, it has been largely difficult to get people to engage. And so we're trying on our part really to increase that engagement and make those plans more meaningful, really get that upfront input into what those discrete objectives, because when we're talking about a 10 year time horizon and we're talking about, you know, our ability to man, we have a much better idea about where we will be operating in that 10 years 
uh, versus say a more open-ended FMP that's you know decades and decades. And uh, so we can we can really quantify those objectives. And when we can quantify those objectives, we can then monitor those. So I didn't go into detail of walking through everything in that in that one slide. Um, but you know, there's there's the implementation plans, there's the AOPs, but then there's also off of the implementation plans the monitoring plans that go along with them. And so it's really just as important as those discrete objectives is are we achieving those? And then to the extent, you know, because okay, we're never going to put out an implementation plan that makes everybody happy. So you know, we won't we'll dispense with that idea. Um, but everybody's concerns can be heard and everybody's concerns can at least be understood and where where people are not necessarily getting what they want out of a particular objective or a particular objective they want, we can at least incorporate that into the monitoring plan. So at the end of the day, at the end of a, any 10 year period, we have something to go on there for helping us form that up um, for the next implementation cycle. So there's a process of continual engagement and continual improvement to, uh, there that that we're really that we'll always I think I think be leaning on. Yeah, thanks, Mike and Brett. All right, let's see. Um, let's go to Trigby and then Craig Patterson. Oh, I'm muted. I am curious about this NEPA process. In my understanding of a NEPA process, you end up with a set of alternatives that are developed, uh, as was you know very nicely described. But ultimately, isn't it correct that there is ultimately a selection of one of those alternatives? Uh, and that alternative is embodied in the record of decision, at which point the other alternatives, while they are there potentially in reserve, if a revision is required, they are not freely accessible uh, to pursue. So is that an appropriate uh, delineation of things? Because earlier I heard an implication that we could just, you know, adopt one of the other alternatives willy-nilly uh, without a separate significant process. So Terry, uh, do you have a, a reply for this? I do. And I'll also ask uh, Troy and any from, one from Fish and Wildlife Service with experience to chime in too. So the NEPA process that many of us are accustomed to in Oregon and Washington is the federal land management process for service BLM who come up with a wide array of alternatives, move forward in the process, make tweaks, and then come out with their decision. Um, this process is really an Endangered Species Act Section 10 driven process. And it is optional. And so ODF and the Board of Forestry are the ones putting forward the Habitat Conservation Plan. Through the NEPA process, we will identify a range of alternatives based on the comments that we received. So for example, we may have an alternative that has more restrictions in the riparian areas. We may have alternatives that are you know, longer or shorter um, time frame for the permit. We may have um, tweaks of the HCAs versus timber. So there may be all these different alternatives that are out there. And any of them that meet the requirements, you know, meet the purpose and need will be analyzed. If um, ODF and the Board of Forestry in seeing the NEPA analysis are willing to change their proposed action, those things can be incorporated in the final Habitat Conservation Plan, and that can be permitted. But this is a very optional process for the state. So whatever comes forward as the final HCP must be 
the state's desire. So it's a little, it's different than the typical federal land management process. Yeah, right. So a little different than the typical NEBA process. And just wanted to see if, um, I don't know if Paul or Rich are on, if they wanted to add anything from a um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service perspective. Um, well, just in a general perspective, I, I guess um, all the alternatives analyzed under NEPA, um, if we were to come up with the uh, preferred alternative, um, it, I'll just say it's uh, it would not be appropriate um, and uh, we would not come up with a willy-nilly alternative. Um, you know, it, this, this NEPA process is no different than, than any other, uh, basically. So, um, you know, the alternatives are analyzed and there will be a record of decision that will explain why we pick the alternative, but it, it will not be willy-nilly. Um, by willy-nilly, I was actually thinking in terms of once we've gone through the process and have a record of decision, is it, it seems to me that is the course of action for the future. And there is at that point, at least somewhat of a foreclosure of the various alternatives that were developed in this NEPA process. That's where I was referring to the willy-nilly. In other words, once there's a record of decision, it would seem to me that we have foreclosed the various other alternatives that were analyzed and we've adopted one of them. That is correct. Okay. Sorry about that willy-nilly reference. It's great. It's great I'm to clarify that it. technical term <laughs> of willy-nilly. Right. <laughs> perfect. All right, um, so let's go to Craig Patterson. Yes, <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I have been engaged with the Northwest Power Planning Council's efforts of late to look at the eighth regional energy plan. And of course, part of that is dealing with the fish and wildlife issues of which the BPA has spent almost $19 billion for fish and wildlife recovery over the last 40 years. And OWEB board has spent almost a half a billion dollars in the last 20 years. Oftentimes funding projects like the South Fork project or the, the um, projects on the McKinsey that loggers would have gotten fined for big time 40 years ago, but they call it restoration. But my, my point is, is this, given the fact that the major negative changes regarding the Endangered Species Act have happened over the last 60, 80 years, where is the information regarding the trends? The trends of what has happened with salmon and with steelhead and with many of the Andromedas fish. We have, it seems like with many bureaucratic efforts, there is an attempt to look from here forward without the benefit of really understanding the historical context and how radical it has really been in the time that we've been on this planet. So my question is, where is the, the historical context that really brings to light the seriousness of the problems that we face? And why is it that Oregon has by far the least restrictive regulations of any state on the Pacific West Coast. And I've gotten that recently in an email from Dr. Jerry Franklin, who most of you probably know, who, who says it in spades, that or, we're, we're behind the eight ball when it comes to any kind of basic regulations to solve any of these problems. 
And I don't hear any real serious discussion of any change forward. And it's very dis discouraging. Yeah, thanks, Craig, for sharing. And maybe, Mike, any thoughts on that or others? Um, well, from the state forest perspective, I would say that, you know, um, you know our our historical context in terms of when we came into management of the lands, the condition of the lands at that time. Some of the things that were done, uh, sort of during that transition or immediately after, are fairly well understood and mistakes that were made, um, and so forth. You know, for instance, uh, removing wood from creeks is the one that people always, uh, you know, sort of gravitate towards. Um, you know, so certainly there's a lot of that, that that we understand. It doesn't speak to the overall regulatory um, uh, context uh, that you're that you're speaking to. However, I think our forest management planning efforts, uh, again, being a, a basically a bit of a different process and a step um, a, a step above, uh, if you will, I think in most people's perceptions. Uh, of the the basic minimum requirements, you know, is all really really what this this process is about, and looking for those opportunities to restore and maintain, uh, protect and enhance uh, habitats and uh, both aquatic and, and terrestrial. Um, so yeah, thanks, Michael. Michael, I hear the words, but I don't see the actions. And let me give you a specific example. Quartz Creek off the main stem of the McKinsey. When Roseboro was clear cutting Quartz Creek, there were 564 designations in the FACTS program of high risk areas, high risk sites, and northern spotted owl sites that meant nothing. There was no mitigation whatsoever. And I've tried to ask succeeding people in ODF where is the mitigation ever? You know, you have these rules, but why even have the rules if you're not going to follow up? Four, 564 designations and nothing. And then that was in, in February and November of 96. And then in, in February of 90, or that was before 96, excuse me, that was in the 80s that it was clear cut for the most part. And then in February of 96, the McKinsey River was running 2,200 NTU units in terms of turbidity at the EWEB intake, 50 miles downstream, and the threshold for clean water is between five and 10. You know, when we don't recognize that the primary resource in the landscape is the soil, we will become extinct. Thank you, Karen. Um, Commissioner Banks and then Cindy Albrecht. Uh, my question's pretty easy, I think, to answer. Um, is there a more recent comparative analysis available online to view other than the one that was offered last fall in 2020? No, that's so that's the most recent comparative analysis that is still available on the website on in, in the work products uh, list on the right hand side of the website. Um, and, you know, that uh, a reminder that comparative analysis was done last October to inform the board decision at that point in time um, and and was and, um, you know, there's been no we've been hearing today about the, the work that's ongoing with the forest, the forest management plan. I gave a little update on you know, not much is changing on the HCP. And so I would say by and large, that comparative analysis still holds. Um, there's not been substantial changes on any of those documents that would necessitate, you know, uh, major changes to that at this point in time. Um, so it's still a good, good reference point in the planning process. Okay. okay, so there's been no major changes between October and March when you submitted it to the NEPA process? Well, there in the HCP, there were some changes, and there is a document on the website that that outlines what those changes between October and March are. Um, and so, I think, but I think the um, you know again, the modeling that was used to support that comparative analysis and the assumptions that went into that modeling are still still hold true, um, even with the March submittal. Okay, thank you. Thank you. 
and Cindy. Hello there. Uh, I'm going in a whole different direction. Um, it's been interesting and a little educational, but um, I, I am a member of a group called OET, Oregon Equestrian Trails. Uh, we're a volunteer organization that goes in and we build and maintain horse camps and um, horse trails, which end up being multi-use trails. Um, my, my chapter of our, our organization helped build Sandy M Horse Camp that is in the Gates area, in the Monument Peak area. And it, um, it maintained a devastational um, attack by the wildfire last year. And I know ODF doesn't concentrate on, on recreation, you know, I, and I do understand that it's it's mostly for revenue, which is great when the rev, some of the revenue goes to some of the local counties and stuff. But we're just um, we're a little confused on how a devastating fire like that happened, and how. <sighs> There was tree trimming in the horse camp a few years back and the horse camp itself actually wasn't damaged, but all of the surrounding horse trails just met um, horrible devastation because the big stumps that were left, they burned and then the roots down under the trails burned. So. Right now, nothing is safe for people or animals to get in there and recreate. I um, don't know how any of that works into your, you know, your future plans, but I do know recreation is a big part of income for all areas of the state. And I just kind of wanted to know if anybody's addressing any of that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's a that's being handled at a few different levels. Um, you know, you saw the general goals uh, related to recreation, education, and interpretation that we have uh, that we laid out today. What's really more important is uh, recently the division reorganized our workforce, and one of the whereas uh, previously. Um, districts sort of did their own thing uh, with recreation, um, and it's in response to demand, and some, some districts have developed more infrastructure uh, for recreation, uh, more recreational opportunities than others over time. Um, but the, during the reorganization, we actually set up a recreation education interpretation team to coordinate those efforts better and to do a lot of strategic visioning. And they are currently uh, doing strategic visioning around that. Um, and then we'll be putting out some more tactical uh, recreation uh, and also uh, education interpretive plans. And those will be incorporated into our implementation plans. Uh, and I know that they are, look, they are doing outreach on those. I don't think, uh, I don't see anybody in the room here, I don't believe, uh, who can speak to it more directly um, today, but uh, definitely we are trying to really leverage those opportunities to get people engaged in the forest and uh, have that infrastructure and those opportunities available. Yeah, thank you, Mike, Cindy. And Robbie, did you have a response to that? Yeah, just to add a little context for Mike. So we have been engaged with SPAC on some of the REI stuff, and we are planning uh, recreation, like new infrastructure inside the fires as well to show how a working forest operates, you know, after a fire uh, and doing a bunch of education and interpretation. And the Stadium Horse Camp, you know, we did thin it before the fire, so it did hold up well. And a lot of the damage in the horse camp is also blowdown as well. And, 
we, we think about the fire being devastating, but there was three days of 70 mile an hour winds. So where there wasn't fire, we had wind damage. And so, you know, there, that's where we're going after stuff as well and trying to get the trails safe. Our REI staff is actively up there every day, trying to open up those areas as quickly as possible. They know it's a wonderful place to recreate close to Salem. So they are doing their best. And they are, as Mike said, they're coming up with a long-term strategic plan that they'll be, you know, we will be engaging stakeholders with, and we're gonna start develop, developing that after fire season. So in the fall, and so look for more of that then for the recreation-minded folks. That way they can start uh, helping us guide our plans for REI into the future. Yeah, thanks, Robbie. That's really helpful. And Laura? Hi, again, Laura with Hampton Lumber. So um, there's been several references to the modeling that's been done. Troy, you just mentioned the modeling that was done for the comparative analysis. And there's modeling going on now for the EIS. Um, is that data publicly available or are those model runs publicly available or is it just the inventory that you guys have you know on file now or where is that because I keep hearing all these different modeling references and I, I don't know where that is or if it's publicly available and if it's not can someone explain why yeah oh did you want to go first Troy no nope. I was going to say Mike knows <laughs> well, I, I, I don't have the URL off the top of my head, but uh, yes, those are all publicly uh, available. Both the, um, we made the uh, GIS data behind it, the source data, more uh, readily available for folks to look at. But for those who are familiar with model data, we do have that and we will, we can get that to you. Um, I know that several people got it uh, initially right after the comparative analysis uh, and downloaded that, but I'm not sure who all uh, requested that information, but we'll get that to you. And that's different than just the inventory that's done every couple of years, or is that what you're referring to? No, no, it's actually the modeling results, and there are workbooks that go with the modeling results, uh, basically that sh that show in in quite a bit of detail um, the the outcomes. Okay, and is that being updated then, as other models are being you know run right now, either for the EIS NEPA stuff or now with going into the FMP? I can't I can't speak to the EIS and the state of that modeling currently, but um, for the forest management plan, yes, we'll make that available in the same uh, in the same way. Okay, thanks. Thanks, and Jay Holiday. Thank you, and, and thanks for organizing the uh, the afternoon session today. It's been very useful. Um, I'm a rural. Uh, coastal resident uh, in southern Clatsop County, uh, just north of Orange Cape. And like 20 of my neighbors and a lot of other people around the state, uh, we get the only source of our drinking water is some pretty primitive uh, apparatus that brings water down from, from either springs or streams. Uh, and these are obviously in forested areas and, and the indiscriminate uh, logging, if you will, uh, does cause quite a bit of damage to these systems and imperils our, our, our water supplies. My question is, is the econ I hear a lot about, uh, about the financial considerations of, of forestry and, and the dollars involved there and stuff. And, and yet in Liz's opening comments, she talked about the quality of water and the goals. There were two pieces about water, one for drinking and one for, for habitat. It, are there dollars being associated with the availability of water and the quality of the water coming out of our forest for uh, our residential consumption? Because those, those are significant numbers as they would impact property values, uh, 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 taxes, things like that. Are, are those going into some of the metrics that you're considering as you considering, as you consider the, the greater economic good, if you will, of, of the goals and the further plans. So I, um, 
On the FMP side, uh, typically what we've done is we have reported out on, uh, and, and water would be something that we would be improving this time uh, compared to the last time that we've done FMP analysis. And it's very difficult to, you know, take a particular strategy and say, oh, okay, it will increase or decrease flow by this much, uh, for instance. But we can, you know, talk about the proportion of young stands, uh, as I was alluding to earlier, you know, in, in these watersheds that might be harvested. And so, you know, and you can uh, think about the, the uh, results of that. When it comes to actually assigning dollars to ecosystem services, um, that's always been a challenge for us. And whenever we're talking about a particular resource, we tend to talk about the resource itself uh, in its uh, uh, state, if you will. So when we talk about habitat, for instance, we tend to talk about the quality and quantity of habitat on the landscape, but assigning you know, economic value to that um, is not something that we have, that we have typically done. So that's not meant to give it less weight. Um, obviously, it's just more a matter of, you know, this part of the equation, what are the habitat outcomes that you want for the landscape um, as part of it? Uh, you know, part of that argument, you know, doesn't really require the, um, or part of the debate, I guess, there doesn't really require the dollars and cents. Um, and drinking water would be, you know, a fairly, uh, I think could be somewhat difficult to capture uh, that way. Um, there's going to be sites, obviously, like, you know, uh, with where you live that are very important, uh, obviously, and, you know, might have a fairly significant economic impact on a particular residential area, if, if I'm kind of following you there. Um, so the impacts would be pretty variable economically across the landscape, but the fact that people need uh, a quality and quantity of drinking water is, is certainly without question. Um, I don't know if that, if that helps. Uh, you know, uh, I, it, I, I think you underscored kind of part of the problem, which is when you look at some of these more ecosystem oriented uh, uh, costs and, 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 and potential expenses. And in fact, the, the, the 20 of us in our section, again, like many others in Oregon, that's the only source of our drinking water. We're not part of a water district somewhere else. So we can't just vote to, you know, join a water district because we're, we're, not, we're, we're not within uh, one or, or uh, that's not available to us. But I, I think, you know, you, you, you set the, the, the kind of the discussion up. Some of it's very subjective which is how valuable is that drinking water to us as residents? And you said it's got a high value, but there's no, nothing associated with it. And yet when you start looking at timber, you, you're starting to look at a real uh, uh, you know, physical cost and or economic value and a value chain. And I think it's real easy to, to look at the, the timber being more important than water because you've got some hard data to go with it. And so I think, I think a lot of this conversation today, and as we've looked at the goals, really brings us back to this, you know, you've got some, some things that are very specific, very concrete, and you've got some that are less so. And it's hard to make judgments within those that becomes very subjective. And I think that's part of the challenge that, that we all face in this process. But uh, I think as was described earlier, uh, you know, drinking water has often been a, a, a stepchild to some of these conversations. And we all know we can't go a day without drinking water. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a hard one to measure, but it's a really important one to human sustenance. So that, that's it. I, I, I appreciate the, 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 uh, uh, the answer, Michael. Yeah, I, and I appreciate the comment and the question. I, I mean, it is it is a really good one there, and and it is it is uh, oftentimes very easy to lose sight of that because something's more difficult to to value economically than something else uh, is, and things can get lost in the discussion there. So, certainly appreciate that. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. And uh, Mesa Miller. 
Thank you. Yeah, I just want to piggyback what Jay was saying. I'm actually the volunteer coordinator for the North Coast Communities for Watershed Protection. So um, we talk about protecting our drinking water a lot in terms of riparian buffers, as well as spraying. And um, I just want to give a couple of examples in terms of like, for example, the infamous Jetty Creek area where over 80% of the watershed was logged. And then Rockaway basically had to pay for the externalities of that cost. And they had to put in like sand filtration and other types of methods to filter their water due to the logging activity above where they live. And that's hard data right there. So looking at what cities pay to then treat their water could probably be, I guess, included in what the timber company should probably be charged for. You know, why is the burden falling on those rural communities? Like me, I live in Garibaldi, for example. So, and there's clear cuts right behind my house. And there's just gonna be one day where, you know, the city is gonna have to unfortunately pay for something that a corporation did. And, um, just coming back to the very beginning of this meeting, where Liz Dent uh, commented multiple times about the goal of ODF um, being to serve Oregonians and our well being, I don't really see how not um, addressing these issues is serving the local rural communities here on the coast in Clatsop and Tillamo County. And of course, all of Oregon. <laughs> so thank you, Jay. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks, Mesa, for bringing attention to that. Thank you. All right. Well, appreciate everyone staying on for some extra time here to ask more questions and, and provide more comments to ODF. Don't see any more hands up. Um, so I think we can probably go ahead and close. We already had a closing from Liz, so I'm not going to force anyone else to do a closing here on the team. Um, but really appreciate everyone participating. And like the team has said, we'll be reaching out to the public and stakeholders for meetings, really when there's key milestones and products to um, review and provide input on. So the draft FMP goals were really a big touch point here. And the next piece will be those um, strategies to support the goals. So be looking in your inbox for emails um, on those meetings that are planned for October. Yet to be scheduled, but probably planned for October. And Mesa, did you have your hand up again or is that from before? No, I actually have one more actual question question just for like clarification. Um, there seems to be, so I understand that like private, I understand that ODF doesn't have like, you know, um, doesn't regulate logging on like private land, but somehow private land still has to um, abide by like the Forest Practices Act. Is that correct? And would they then, or is it just when private timber companies log on ODF land? Is that the only time they have to abide by those? Oh, so. Um, ODF has has three operational divisions. Um, one is state forests. Uh, the other two are the protection from fire program, obviously uh, fighting wildfires. And then the other is uh, the private forest program. And they administer the Oregon Forest Practices Act on private lands. So all non-federal timber harvest uh, in the state of Oregon is subject to the FPA and it is the private forest program that um, administers those regulations. Great, thank you so much. So my comments about, you know, logging above communities on private land definitely does apply to um, this conversation in terms of the HPC and the forest management plan, correct? Well, um, so there are important considerations for state forest management, but the activities that you're referencing are actually on private lands. And so our state forests 
HCP and FMP will not address um, anything really related to private timber harvest. Okay, that's, I think that's what that's, my question was basically. So sounds like the Forest Practices Act does influence private land and what they can do on it, but not the HPC or the management plan? That's correct. Those are specific to state forests. Got it. Okay. Thank you. The board, the board oversees both divisions. So concerns about private lands or public state forests, like you, you would express both to the board. But then, you know, we have no, we don't do any, we don't deal with private lands at all other than sort of coordinating management across lands. So that's, that's, that's the private forest division. Yeah, so maybe Mesa, it sounds like you have a lot of questions about the private forest division. Maybe if offline you get in touch with Mike or who all, whoever wants to field it to put Mesa in touch with the right person to talk about those issues would be helpful. I was going to say, um, Mesa, if you want to, um, I'm with the public affairs program here at ODF. Um, I'm happy to give you a 101 on that kind of stuff. Um, if you want to, I'll drop my email in the chat and and it's jason.r.cox at oregon.gov. Um, so I can happy to give you a kind of 10,000 foot view of uh, sort of this process, what this applies to, what it does not apply to, and um, where you might be best served kind of talk directing the concerns that you're talking about in regards to harvest on private land. I appreciate that, thank you. Absolutely. I got um, you now, thank great. you. No, um, as a non-forestry person, I can definitely relate to um, uh, everything you're asking when I started here, so. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. I think that kind of closes our meeting for today and looking forward to getting continued engagement with you all and looking forward to meetings in October when those get scheduled. Thanks for being here today, everyone. It was a pleasure meeting with you all. Thank you for your participation. This has been great. Bye, thanks. Thanks all.